outfits and everything. Thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us celebrating um, African culture, diversity. My name is Lee Kasumba. I'll be your host for the evening. Your Excellencies, all the ambassadors joining us representing this beautiful continent and then distinguished speakers and then the musicians and the dancers and then also to the Center of African Philanthropy and the social and social investment. Thank you so much for being our partners as well as our, our do NEPAD, um, the African Union Development Agency, the My Mandela Institute for Development Studies. Thank you also for being here. And then, of course, our gracious hosts, hosts the University um, of Witwatersrand, and then, of course, the Wit Business School, Sculpting Global Leaders. Now, when I, when I looked at the, the event and the title, it's the Africa we want. What kind of Africa do we want? Do we want an Africa that is inclusive, that is sustainable and an Africa which we can all be proud of? And surely the answer is yes. The University of the Witwatersrand as a university is fully committed to those goals. And what have we done already? Can't we be proud that we are a research intensive university on the African continent that contributes to the African education? at a very, very, very high level. And this is what WITS has contributed up till now. What we are known for at WITS is paleontology. We look to the past. But we also engage in looking into the past by looking into the future through astronomy and other high-level programs. Our origins as a people and our origins as Africans. So thank you for being here tonight. Our next speaker this evening is Dr. Nkosana Moyo, who is the founder of the Mandela Institute for Development Studies. There is a story that goes that there was a Japanese emperor who on the occasion of the defeat of Japan, he told his people that Japan would never be of any importance unless they did a couple of things. The first one was that they should master Western technology in warfare. The second one was that they should do that on a Japanese heart. Our history post-independence is characterized by lots of struggles with the issue of developing and improving the quality of lives of our citizens. Why are we struggling so much? If you look back and look at the articulation of why we went to, to fight the struggles was precisely to liberate our people, not just in terms of give them freedom, but quality of life. It's spelled in many different ways, but the essence is the same. So I think we owe it to ourselves to ask the question, why are we where we are? We hope that minds helps to make people understand that that question should not lead to um, simplistic answers and answers which are simply excuses, finger pointing and saying because of somebody else. But that we seek to identify almost like in a non-emotional way, in a physics kind of scientific way, what are the forces as opposed to who are the people? What are the forces that led us to be here? What are the forces which we need to change as we go forward, if we're going to get different results. Now, the reason why I start with the Japanese emperor is because one of the mind's hypotheses is that we are the only people as of today who continue to live their lives in imitation, in mimicry of other people. The platform, the essence of the learning had to be themselves. It appears to me that we, on the other hand, have taken the view that we will absolutely learn from other people, but we'll also discard the platform. We'll also discard our own identity. We keep all our, t uh, well, we, we use all our energy, all our efforts trying to be somebody else. We're running away from who we are. My humble opinion, again, is that 
For as long as we do this, we will not succeed because you cannot be something you're not. So our challenge is to absolutely be open to what is going on in our world, in the global world that we live in. Be open, learn as much as possible. But the platform on which we stand, the platform on which we bring those learnings has to be us. We have to be grounded. We have to be rooted. As of now, my humble opinion is that we're not. Now, um, our next speaker uh, for this evening is actually the person who this entire evening is themed around based on a book that he's written. Um, it's, he's from the University of Pretoria. He's also the author of What, of, of what is Africanness? Um, Professor Charles Nguenya is here to share a bit with us. Uh, it is time that we accept that contrary to our colonial history, Africanness does not reside in the color of skin. So I argue we are better served by a notion of African identity that recognizes that identity is something that is continuously unfolding. It is the outcome of multiple ancestries, of multiple cultures, genders, sexualities, and many other human associations. Whilst we cannot ignore the powerful and persistent presence of race in the making of African identity, the important point I wish to make is that we should strive towards an architecture of Africanness that is capable of accounting for historical movement, for intersectionalities and agency within African identities. Whilst indeed we draw on our past when imagining our identities, we are not irreversibly tied to the past. So I end by saying we make our identities for now and the future. Africanness is not pre-constituted, but is ours to make. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to add that history once again has been made with Africa now having its own development agency. From the OAU, where the agenda was to um, see that all African countries get their independence, that same um, approach, uh, one could say, um, wasn't um, given with regard to the development agenda of the continent. You might all know that the last two years, the continent through the African Union has been going through a process of transformation and reform um, to make sure that the African Union institutions are more responsive to the citizens of this continent. So Agenda 2063, it has a particular aspiration, Aspiration 5, that stays um, for an African with a strong cultural identity, common heritage, shared values, and ethics. This is why we are here today celebrating our Africanness. When we had the finals of the, the um, Rugby World Cup, so I was in Durban last week and coming back. So you get on the plane and everyone, of course, had to switch off their phones. So when we landed, as soon as the plane touched ground, everyone was switching their phones on, and there was a collective uproar on the plane. The Springbok had won. Of course, the celebration of the victory of the Springbok was just not, um, for me, was really an African thing. It was everyone. It doesn't matter the color, everyone celebrated that victory. And I think it goes to the point that Professor Nguyen was making that we cannot define Africanness as a matter of race. From the Nepal perspective, we do see the issue of tourism as one of the leading sectors that can drive growth and transformation in the continent. It has the potential to be inclusive. It has the potential to address issues of inequality. And we have a rich and diverse Africa in every aspect. Make sure this issue of Africanness is just not something we celebrate in an evening. 
but it's something that we own, it's something that we make, and something that pushes the continent forward and drives the transformation of this continent. Thank you. Um, our next uh, speaker for the evening is Professor Kwesi Pra, who is a Pan-Africanist from Kumasi, Ghana. As a cross between an anthropologist and a sociologist, I was through these peregrinations in Africa, able to see Africa at a scientific, social scientific level, analytical level, in a way which many people miss. Culture is the distinguishing feature between us and the rest of the animal world. Humans make culture, and culture makes humans. It's a dialectical relationship. When you look at culture, scientifically, culture divides into two areas. There is the tangible cultures and the intangibles. The tangibles, physical, everything that is tactile, observable, perceptible. There is also the culture which is intangible which you cannot hold, you cannot see, you cannot touch. That is language, religion, certain aspects of ritual, customs, tastes, attitudes, beliefs, that area. We tend to think that when you talk about culture, you are talking about dances. You're talking about things you see in the museum. <laughs> In other words, we take over the Western idea, we exotify culture. But culture is larger than that. Culture is what makes us all. And of all this, these areas of culture, the most important area, the most significant, important area, the determining pillar which holds the whole edifice of culture together is language. It is in language that ultimately Africanness is defined. It's in your culture. When you translate everything in the rest of the world into your language, you indigenize that knowledge. There is no society where indigenous knowledge has been from Adam <laughs> hermetically sealed, impervious to external influence, strenuous influences. Knowledge always flows in and out. But you must make the knowledge your own. And the only way to make it really your own is when you put it in your language. It's to point to the fact that unless and until we recenter our languages at the center, we are not going anywhere. The color does not make the African. Overwhelming majority of Africans are black. But not all blacks are Africans. Not all Africans will be black from now and forever. There will come a time when, like the Jews, there will be Africans who are blonde and black. And that will not save us. People think that, oh, the African is black. But they take that imagery rather from the, our diaspora who have suffered and who continue to suffer because of their color in America. And we transpose that view into the situation we have here in Africa. In fact, apart from Southern Africa, there is nowhere in Africa where 95% plus of the people are not just black. Black is normal. It's normal there in the black and white, this dichotomy is a product of a special kind. 
it's not everywhere. And blackness is a, is a bonus for us. I'll tell you why it's a bonus. Culturally, if you go to, when you say um, it's a bonus, it's a bonus because Jews, for example, have traditions of religion, beliefs, rituals, which hold them together. A Jew from China or a Jew from Argentina or a Jew from Europe or a Jew from Spain may look quite different. But these institutions, these cultural institutions, hold them all together. By the same token, people may look exactly the same and react sharply against each other because of that. If you take a Pakistani and an Indian, they want to be at each other's throats all the time. We are lucky because, because of the fact that we don't have a unifying written religion, you see. And even our languages, for the most part, are not written properly now, even right now. Africans is culture, history, and there are two imperialisms, two forces which have eroded this. The first is the Arab conquest of North Africa, starting from when they built the first mosque in Cairo in 642 AD. Don't forget about this thing of color, 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 color. It's, 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 it's the wrong direction altogether. You know, it is culture which matters. And in culture, the main pillar is language. And not language as we speak it, just orally. Language which is written, language which survives, language which can test time and stand the test of time. The gift of the tongue, which in fact defines us. The, the language question in Africa is enormous. That is the key. That is the key. There is no society which makes progress on the basis of a borrowed language or somebody else's language. No society. And if you look carefully at all the societies of Asia, which are making great progress now, if you look at them, you see they were colonized also by Westerners. Indonesia was colonized for 300 years. The Dutch finally left in 1948, but even then, between 45 and 55, they were still carrying on what they call pollutional axes. You know, they were just shooting people, you see. Now, the youth of Indonesia, in 1928, the first nationalist movement started in Indonesia, said, Bahasa is our language, and that's the language you want in our future. 20 years later, they put it in practice. They into, when I got to Europe in the beginning of the 60s, some of my friends who were Indonesian were telling me that lots of them were finding jobs in Malaysia as teachers of Bahasa. Malaysia got its independence in August 1957, six months after Ghana. Look at where they are now. They use Bahasa. They haven't thrown out English altogether, but they have not allowed English to undermine the sovereignty of their own language. What happened in the history of Africanism, where women had to find themselves submitting. You, there's a whole lot of things that are done under the language that is now said to be African, but then when you trace back the steps, there's a contradiction in what really happened and transpired and documented in stones at what Africanism is and what it was translated to. Patriarchy, matriarchy are 
positions of dominance. It is not, it is not just a division of labor. It's positions of preeminence. And whenever you have positions of power, and you have to look into it a bit, a bit more intensely. My take on it is that I think the, the foundation of the whole oppression and of women is economic. Women, if women have the same rights to law, in law, to the accumulation of money, capital, inheritance, transfer of wealth. But you don't say that this one is a boy, is my son, therefore he inherits. No. That, that women have access completely in exactly the same way as men to all financial sources and so on. That thing will be broken in no time. But if you leave it just to discussions and the good hearts of men and women and without changing the structure, nothing will change. Nothing will change. I think, Professor, just to add, I think part of what she also wanted to find out about is that when you look historically um, with the Ashanti people, when you look in South Africa with the Zulu people, women played such a huge role. The men would not move until the woman said so. So when did it change? When, did, when do you feel that change and how does that interlink with language? But I think the social economic, economic basis of, of equality has to be installed, has to be put in place. Total equality in the economic sense, I think that, that, that's, that's the thing. Constantly mimicking American cultures that are seen on social media platforms and often learned from celebrities through their fashion and the music that they make. Thank you. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. The United States is the most powerful country ever since the end of the 19th century. Now, American power and influence has gone everywhere. That is why our people in America are the African people of America, you know, have a sympathetic ear to us, you know, and we relate to whatever they do. But at the same time, we should remember that they are Americans. They are part of American culture. And American culture is a dominant culture in the world today. Look at where Coca-Cola is. So that's why we must be firm. We should stand firm. And it will come, the moment we start using our languages more, we'll be able to put in better distance, healthy distance, between ourselves and some of these cultural influences from outside. Today's event presents a moment in the history of our continent when we come together as Africans to celebrate unity through our diverse cultures. It just makes me so angry when every day our leaders go to the UN and some of them just sleep. Ooh, I could kick them. <laughs> And when our leaders go to the UN and leave their people in their countries, not even knowing what they are doing or going to say there, it's time that we bring young people, young leaders are needed in this continent. Now is the time for us to do things for ourselves. It hurts me as a mother to see our young men and women die in the sea wanting greener pastures, what have we done? Why are our people not 
having jobs in their own countries? Why are our people wanting to escape, to go to other countries for greener pastures? Africa, Mashariki, Africa, please change. People are happier at home. People can do things they want to do at home. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no wealth without health and education. As stakeholders here from different places and different walks of lives, ladies and gentlemen, let us foster partnership and add our energies together in driving progress on continent. I'm an inspiration, bringing education on gender equalization. So much sensation, feel the vibration. Let me show you who I am. I'm a woman. Thank you. Now, to give, uh, to give us uh, just the, the evening thanks and a note of thanks is somebody who has flown in quite literally right now. He is all the way from Tanzania. Um, he's a board member of the Mandela Institute for Development Studies, one of the most dynamic leaders that we have within the continent. It is such a privilege. I'm glad that you came straight from the airport to uh, the function to be here with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. Ali Mufuruki. Karibu sana. I've been busily tweeting uh, the quotes that I could capture from uh, uh, Professor Pra's uh, presentation. I think it's extremely important to hear someone say that race is a bankrupt idea devoid of any value or of a scientific nature. Uh, at a time when everywhere you look, people are talking about race and how important it is and how we should be presently engaged with it. And it's always troubled me. Uh, you have helped clarify it for me. But also the importance of language. as probably the single most uh, important factor in distinguishing people from one another in terms of uh, 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 their cultures, which language helps underpin, but also his warning that if we don't learn to write our languages today, it will not, or they will not survive the digital age. So this has been a very important lesson for me, and I hope it was for you. The question that I still want us to answer is, are we going to find what we are missing the most today? Which is self-love, love for one another, and solidarity. Do we feel that solidarity for one another? I want you to ask that question uh, as you live here and think about it. So once again, thank you very much, and I wish you all a very good evening. You know, let's never take for granted for the, the fact that we come from the greatest continent in the world, quite literally. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to all the partners. Thank you to all the distinguished speakers. Thank you to our esteemed guests. And thank you to everybody for joining us. And thank you for helping us celebrating our Africanness. Enjoy the rest of your evening.